Good afternoon and welcome to the inaugural lecture series on behalf of the Nasky Michelin Foundation to honor the legacy of the first president and founder of Austro Community College. We are very grateful to Dr. Daisy Coco de Filippis who have opened the doors of the house to come to you together as a group to really honor Dr. Nasky Michelin. And uh, to introduce at, uh, this lecture series, which is a hell idea, let me bring up to you Dr. Daisy Coco de Filippis, who again, we have to say happy birthday, and she's celebrating another anniversary of her coming in to really help the Latino community. Thank you, Dr. Coco de Filippis, for helping us to be with you today and the host of family. Now, Dr. Lantigua, I have to tell you that over the years, in my experience with the Dominican community and the Dominican diaspora, whether I was in Connecticut or in New York, your name looms very large in terms of your kindness, your involvement, your intellectual contributions to this growing community. As we mentioned uh, in, at the two o'clock panel, uh, there is no larger Dominican community in the world outside of the Dominican Republic than the one who lives in the Bronx. I thank your interest in the college, your interest in working with the college and supporting this lecture series so generously, augurs really well for what I hope would be a number of opportunities for the college and Columbia University uh, School of Public Health and other schools to, to contribute. I am so very grateful and had an opportunity to chat a little bit with Dr. Ann, that he, uh, he so understands us and he is so willing to do that. We are honored, sir, and you are our inaugural speaker. And that means a lot. You will go in our history books as a person initiating this in the company of this giant, this absolute giant of the Dominican community who is Dr. Rafael Antigua. So welcome. And I thank my colleagues. I thank uh, Diana Kramer, Victor Santana, Dean Ana Garcia Reyes, and many others who contribute to the absolute generosity of meetings like this. It is important for us to be informed as a community. And I have to tell you, just in recent conversation with some of the students, in our SGA, for example, the whole issue of Dr. Lantigua, which you addressed last evening so well at the Dominicans in the Hill of vaccinations and the need for vaccinations came up. And I think this is probably should be perhaps a topic for a further lecture uh, uh, if, if it cannot be addressed this evening. So I am really just saying mil gracias, bendiciones, thank you so very much for doing this, which is your absolute commitment to help our Osto's beautiful community of students, faculty, and staff. Mil gracias. Thank you, Madam President. And uh, again, you don't know how happy we are as Dominicans to have you as the leader of Osto's Community College. I mean, Osto's is an educator that you know, I mean, we Dominican have in our heart. And that's what Dr. Michelin was thinking about the name that we decided to be Osto's because Osto's it's live in the Dominican Republic. He's there, his body's there. I mean, and then like I said this afternoon, now we're combining the forces of the Bronx and uh, Washington Heights, Columbia and Austin's Community College. Looking forward to continue to educate our youngsters, our minorities, African-American, Latinos, and others who don't, have, who don't have the opportunity in reality to really, I mean, get a four-year college in the beginning, not because they don't have the intellect, but they don't have the finance. And that was, is also there for them. Also is there as a first step that they can continue to have their education. And your leadership is really appreciated. And we know, like you said, I mean, that uh, since at, uh, the winter of 2019, especially around the holidays, that uh, China let us know there was a virus that we get to know as a COVID-19 that really was causing what we thought in the beginning was just pneumonia. We soon learned there was a type of coronavirus that was known. And by January, we had identified this virus. But soon after, the virus was in Europe, and then it was in the West Coast of the United States, 
And then this goes to the United States. And now more than 28 million persons have been affected. And we know that uh, more than half a million people have died just in this country from this what we call a pandemic. It's true. I mean, we'll talk about vaccine in the next election, about the importance of vaccinations, but the physical effect, the economical effect, and especially the mental health effect of this pandemic in our community are really devastating. And we are so lucky, like you mentioned in the beginning, to have an expert on mental health, a professor of psychiatry at Columbia University, the head of our department of child and adolescent psychiatry, a member of the board of the American Psychiatric Association, a person who serves as president of the uh, American Academy of Psychiatry, adolescent psychiatry, I mean, at, uh, a person that I'm so proud that uh, we work together. And every time they ask him, at uh, Warren, could you please give me the lecture? He never say no. I mean, he's a person of people. I mean, like the same way that you are. I mean, he's a person that is all present. He loves communities. He loves his work at the head of the adolescent services at the Morgan Stanley Hospital. And like I said, it's my honor to introduce to you somebody that you, at the end of the lecture, you will love, not only because of his knowledge, but also because of his personality. My good friend, Dr. Warren Ainge. Dr. Warren Ainge. Warren. Thank you so much. It is such a privilege and such an honor. Thank you so much, President Coco de Filippis and Dr. Lantigua, you are my hero. Um, and it is an honor um, to be here today and to share the wisdom, but also share the compassion and the heart and the strength of the resilience of the Dominican community and the Hostos community and the world at large. So I'm just privileged um, to be able to share this time with all of you. Thank you so much for coming. So with that, I will start um, the presentation. So I'm gonna share my slides um, so that you can see them and then we will start. So, you know, I really take the pleasure of this experience to acknowledge as President Coco de Filippo shared, this is the largest Dominican community outside of the Dominican Republic, and yet it is such a source of strength and resilience. So I want to acknowledge the importance of community resilience in the time of COVID-19, and also acknowledging the importance of Dominican Heritage Month and to celebrate the richness that allows us to be strong, even in the darkest times. So with that, I don't have any disclosures um, in terms of my presentation, except for the fact that I'm humbled and honored um, to share this space with all of you. You know, I think that the moment of honoring Dr. Micheline um, at the Hostos Community College and one of the founders is such an important moment as a physician leader who championed Latino representation, Latino medical care, and also the enhancement of the workforce. Because when people look like you who take care of you, they understand you in a different way. Um, and I think that it's no surprise that streets are named after Dr. Michelin because streets represent direction. They represent hope. They represent where we're going. And I think that he had the foresight to envision a brighter future, but particularly for the Latino community to have representation leadership and such wonderful um, heroes such as Dr. Lantigua, who's a hero of mine. So just wanting to acknowledge this moment um, and the privilege of it. I also wanted to acknowledge, um, given that it's also um, Hispanic Heritage, but also Black History Month, also our leaders, Martin Luther King and his words that resonate with Dr. Michelin's legacy. And the ultimate measure of a man is not where he stands in moments of comfort and convenience, but where he stands at challenge and controversy. And I think of Dr. Michelin at the time of Trujillo and how he was able to really champion, but lead as one of the leaders of a new hope and new prosperity. Um, and I just wanted to acknowledge the importance of Dr. Micheline's legacy in terms of bringing his wisdom to New York City and to be able to create Hostos Community College, but also many Dominican organizations like the Dominican Medical Association, Alianza Dominicana and others that have really strengthened the community. 
I think at this time, it's also very important for us to acknowledge, similar to what Dr. Lantigua shared, it is a humbling moment when we've lost half a million Americans, but also the Latino and the Latinx representation disproportionately affected. So I just would like to take a moment to honor and remember our loved ones that we've lost in this pandemic so far. Thank you for that moment. Um, I think it's a very sober moment, but also a time when strength and resilience and hope have an important meaning. And I think one of the things in terms of my presentation today, I will speak about COVID-19 and the disproportionate impact on communities of color, specifically our Latinx, Latino community, as well as our African-American community and our BIPOC community because many of the inequities that lead to this have existed for a long time and health disparities is one of them. The next I will talk a bit about COVID-19 as we understand it as a natural disaster phenomenon and how do we as community and societies go through that. And then I will speak more specifically about the mental health impact of COVID-19 especially how it's impacted our communities of color, particularly our Latino community, and then end with some discussions about well-being and resilience and the strength of communities and families and faith and how they've been able to really help us, the beacon of light during this time. So one of the things that is very important, and I echo Dr. Lantigua's words of wisdom in understanding the role of mental health as a part of health. And even before COVID-19, mental health is the silent crisis, especially when one in five adults or children in the United States have a diagnosable mental health disorder, but only a fraction of them receive any kind of treatment. And often the delay in receiving care can be up to eight to 10 years. And there's a lot of issues related to access to care, especially with providers that speak your language, as well as to reflect your worldview, but also the role of stigma and how it prevents us from getting the care that we deserve and that we need. But there's also sobering reality when half of all mental illnesses begin before the age of 14 and 75% of them before the age of 24, when we need to look at our youth and our young people. And especially at this time, they are suffering many different things, but understanding that many of these issues that affect us in our adult years start in our adolescent years. So we need to be mindful of how are we strengthening our communities through our young people and having youth-based programs such as the Line Youth Program and others that really strengthen that empowerment. Even before COVID struck, as I mentioned, a lot of New Yorkers suffer from depression. If one in five New Yorkers suffers from a mental health condition, depression is the most common mental health condition that they suffer from and over half a million at any time will suffer symptoms of depression in New York City. However, once again, many people do not receive the care that they need. And it is important at this time to also acknowledge the importance of faith-based organizations and where houses of worship and churches play an important part in terms of how we can help people heal, but also partnering in terms of how to receive mental health care in a way that is most respectful of that individual. As I move from depression to suicide, it's also acknowledging the fact that suicide affects all of us. When it is the second leading cause of death for 15 to 34 year olds and the fourth leading cause of death for 35 year olds and above, we appreciate that suicide rates have increased about 30% in the last two decades and unfortunately, it continues to climb. And I believe that the COVID-19 pandemic has definitely heightened some of these issues. So I'm saying all of these things to really represent the reality in which we are in, even before the pandemic. So I think as we're talking about the impact of this pandemic on our communities, on our loved ones, we need to also be mindful of what 
was happening beforehand. So one of the things that COVID-19 has laid brutally clear is really the fact that there's a disproportionate impact on communities of color. And a lot of these issues related to inequity in terms of healthcare access or quality of care or receiving care in the language that you speak um, is so important. And there are many health care disparities. And that's why Dr. Michelin, in terms of his vision of recruiting and promoting a health workforce that speaks the language, understands the culture, and represents the community has been so impactful. Also, appreciating that pre-existing social determinants, low-wage employment, digital equity, unaffordable child care, and also overrepresentation in correctional and other immigration detention facilities of people of color are definitely disproportionately impacting communities of color. So this is from Dr. Fortuna in terms of an article looking at how it's had a disproportionate impact on communities of color. When we think about COVID-19, and as you heard from Dr. Lantigua, half a million Americans have been lost to this pandemic so far. However, the loss has not been equal it has been disproportionate, similar to some of the inequities that exist within our systems and structures. So black people have died at 1.4 times the rate of white people and also Hispanic and Latino individuals at more so almost twice the rate compared to white people. And when we look at the New York City data, that is definitely represented here. Now, why are we understanding these discrepancies. There are many factors that contribute to COVID-19 risk that are not about COVID-19, but about the inequities and the disparities that have been here, but that we need to address in terms of improving healthcare for everyone. Some of those things are also discrimination, racism, and also healthcare access and utilization. And also the fact that many essential workers and frontline workers are people of color, and so they're representing the highest risk, as well as the fact that there are gaps in education income, and that's where Hostos Community College has been a beacon of hope in terms of really trying to provide opportunity and um, ways to try to reduce some of the gap by creating opportunities and empowerment through education. The other thing is housing, and we know that in New York City, there are much more crowded housing but also redlining in the past and racist efforts to really um, disproportionately affect communities of color. As we think about COVID-19 and also some of the underlying health conditions that predict worse health outcomes, we know that obesity, hypertension, diabetes, and other chronic medical illnesses are overrepresented often in communities of color because access to care, appropriateness of care, as well as quality of care are all issues that are very important. How you speak to someone about their diet and nutrition through a cultural lens, celebrating the foods that are important to them, but also their connection to their culture and doing it in a way that is meaningful for someone living with diabetes or hypertension who is Latino is different. And how do we understand that in order to provide the best care? And Dr. Lantigua is an expert in that and obviously understanding the wisdom that we can get from our leaders in the field. How COVID-19 affects individuals and communities are different. So the number of cases, the hospitalization, as well as death and mortality, as we're looking across the country, that there are almost three times as much higher number of cases five times as much higher hospitalization, as well as increased deaths if you're Hispanic or Latino or Latinx. So I think that some of these disparities represent some of those inequities that I've mentioned before, but that are longstanding and hopefully through this pandemic raises light to some of these issues that can be addressed. As we also look at COVID-19 in terms of those affected and more highly represented among communities of color, we think about the zip codes. And so Southern Bronx, um, highly represented as well as Northern Manhattan and how 
can these issues of the confluence and the intersection of poverty, communities of color, and health risks come together? So what can we do? But then who can we align our resources to? So as you heard from Dr. Lantigua and President Coco de Felipez, issues related to vaccine hesitancy as well as vaccine access are important. And how do we couch it in a way that is most acceptable and respectful for the culture and the individual? When we look at the death rates, as I shared before, they are different based on race and ethnicity. And within New York City, the death rate is highest among Latino and Hispanic individuals. And we know that for death, um, that is disproportionately affected. And when we think about the loss to a community by a loved one and a community member, those are tremendous. So when we think about New York State, one in 700 Latino children have lost a caregiver or a parent to COVID-19, twice the rate of those who are children who are white in New York State, which is horrible. And so when we think about the impact on families and children, those things are very alarming. And when we think about the death rate also within our communities, disproportionately affecting our older adults. So as you can see, those that are 65 and above or 75 above, those represent our grandparents, our abuelos, our abuelas, and the, the way that they are so important within the fabric of a community, but also the strength of a family, often the caretakers, often the ones who are so important to the children within a home. So just understanding the impact and the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on the Latino community and how it affects children, individuals, and families. So I think that all these things really lead us to think about how has the COVID-19 pandemic really represented a form of natural disaster um, that has struck a community and how many of these issues related to disasters are affecting a community member's ability to respond and take care of themselves. So there are issues of fear, uncertainty. It's also based on their perception of risk. So we see that sometimes some young people don't necessarily feel that they are as affected by COVID-19 and that will change their ability to wear masks or take care of themselves or practice social distancing. So how we understand our risk can also affect our behaviors that are protecting ourselves. But what's important about COVID-19 is it's not about ourselves, it's about our loved ones, it's about our family members, and how can COVID-19, if we unsuspectingly have it, share it with loved ones and have negative impact. So there are some of these other issues that will often affect how we understand pandemics, but also within communities. When we think about the community phases of a pandemic, if we think about this graph showing pre-disaster and the impact, which I think about as March of 2020 last year, and then the period that we go to remember in the city at 7 p.m. when people were cheering on our essential workers, frontline workers, our sanitation workers, our bus drivers, our bodega workers, and then understanding that since that time, people have become exhausted, they've become tired. And after the honeymoon period, often has a period of disillusionment. And during this time, it's really like a battle. We have to stay strong in terms of fighting the battle against COVID-19, that's wearing our masks, practicing all of the public health protective behaviors for not only ourselves, but our families and communities. However, how everyone responds to a disaster and how everyone responds to a pandemic is different. We know that the majority of people will be resilient, so they'll be in that blue circle to the left. However, there are people among us and ourselves included who will have distress reactions, who will have trouble sleeping, a decreased sense of safety, but also increased irritability and a sense of isolation. We're seeing this mostly as well as in our elderly. So our seniors who are isolated, who are in nursing homes and or living alone, but fearful, but also out of their protection are isolated and they're suffering. And so really understanding how does everyone experience this, as well as sometimes increased risky behaviors. We've seen an increase in alcohol use, as well as drug use during this pandemic, because people have 
sort of gone to the things that they know that they have that might affect and change the way that they feel. And that's often drugs and alcohol, but there are other ways of getting help, which is really important. And part of that is acknowledging that it is a mental health condition that can benefit from treatment. So psychiatric disorders such as depression, post-traumatic stress disorder, anxiety, and as I mentioned, complex grief. With the death toll, but also the impact on the Latino community, there's a lot of complex grief and there's a lot of suffering bereavement when we haven't been able to have the funerals, but also the acknowledgements um, of passing of people whose lives we wanted to celebrate. And those things have made it harder for us to breathe and grieve and to be able to heal through this process. So it's important for us to acknowledge all of these things and how it's impacted, particularly the Latino community more so, given the impact of COVID-19. So we talk about the stress continuum. So some of us will be more resilient based on our ability to pull on ourselves, our faith, our families, but also that some of us are gonna have more difficulties and have more distress and have more disorders and it's being able to move beyond the stigma as well as the shame of receiving care and the mental health issue of getting the service we need so that we don't have to suffer silently because mental health is a health condition that can benefit from treatment. So I think with this, um, there's a wonderful phrase that I would that I found on the Dominican, just looking really at el corazón de la aviama, solo lo conoce el cuchillo. And then thinking about the heart of the squash is only known by the knife. And the paraphrase is that we, all, we never know the true suffering of someone. And it's really understanding that we might put on a brave face, but we might be suffering underneath. And it's being able to acknowledge there's no shame in having depression. There's no shame in suffering grief. There's only a shame if we don't get the help and that we're suffering in silence so that we can really reach into our family, our faith, our communities, as well as our loved ones to receive that care. And I think when we think about our former Surgeon General, Dr. David Satcher, that there's no health without mental health because we are all one as how we are, but mental health disorders touch all Americans directly or indirectly but that we don't all have equal access. And that's why celebrating Dr. Michelin is so important today because what he did was he created the pathway so that we could have more access to care, but particularly in a culturally, linguistically, but most effectful, impactful way and really trying to enhance the workforce that represents the community. And I think as we're thinking about that, and as we acknowledge the importance of not only mental health, but also COVID-19, how those things come together is really important. And that not everyone is impacted equally and that mental illness affects those who have had histories of mental health conditions, but also children, adolescents, the elderly, as I mentioned, but also bereavement, that there's been so much loss when twice as many Latino New Yorkers have died from COVID-19. You can imagine how much that will impact not only the individual and the communities. And I walk around Washington Heights and I see the candles in the streets and the memorials to the individuals and the loss within families and our fabric of our society and our, our community is really important. This is just really looking at in the United States as they were comparing 2019 to 2020, there have been increased number of emergency department visits for people with mental health conditions, suicide attempts, overdose, intimate partner, partner violence, as well as child abuse and neglect. And I think many of these things are incredibly important as we're thinking about the impact of our Hispanic and Latino communities. Um, and I do have to give a shout out to one of my wonderful colleagues, um, Yvonne Valle, who's a wonderful social worker at the Washington Heights Community Health Services Clinic at the NYP. And she's definitely one of those people who have responded to that call of acknowledging the importance of mental health conditions as she and also our wonderful team have tried to respond to that need. And she's also a, a professor at Hosto, so I just think she's definitely a leader among teachers. Um, but also acknowledging the fact that anxiety and depressions affect 
more adults. And during this pandemic, we've only seen that increase as we're looking at the US census across the country. But one of the things that's also very important as we've looked at what's been happening because of the pandemic, and it's looking at mental health substance use as well as suicidal ideation. And in one survey that was looking specifically at adults, there was also an increase, 41% increase in having an adverse mental health condition during the pandemic in the past year. The important thing is, is that even though 41% of people reported an adverse mental health condition, we can see that among our young adults, 18 to 24 year olds, 75% of them reported this. And when we look at it by race and ethnicity, 52% of individuals who are Hispanic reported one adverse mental health condition. So that you can see once again, that there is a disparity and there's an increased impact in thinking about not only our young people, but also the who's those who identify as Hispanic. And when we think about their de depressive anxiety and stress related disorders, even though a quarter of people might experience that, 35% who identified Hispanic identified this as being one of their experiences. And when we're thinking about starting substance use or increasing the substance use that they have, we also see that there's a marked increase with young adults as well as different ethnic um, and racial groups, Hispanic as well. One of the things that I am very concerned about and that we saw particularly in the emergency department increased use in the past year because of COVID is really suicidal ideation. And when suicide is already the second leading cause of death for 15 to 35 year olds and the fourth leading cause of death for the age range above that, we know that it's very serious. And 11% overall in this one study were consi considering suicide in the past 30 days. But however, when you look at those that identified as Hispanic, the number was almost twice as much, 19%. We also see that about 30% of unpaid caregivers and adults reported suicidal ideation, as well as 22% of essential workers. And many of these individuals are overrepresented within communities of color who are black and brown, Hispanic or African American. So just appreciating that once again, within the data that we're seeing, we're seeing that more people of color are disproportionately impacted and deserve more of the resources and the attention to address this immediately. The other thing is that it's not only health and mental health, it's also our finances, how we pay the bills, how we have housing security, how we have food insecurity. And so those that were concerned about sort of their stress and anxiety and where they are, the lower income people are always affected more. And so we definitely see that that's important, as well as unemployment. With every 1% increase in unemployment, there's a 1.6 increase in suicide prevalence. So we see that there's a direct correlation to how people feel financially with how they feel in terms of their safety, security, and their well being. So I think that these things are very concerning, but also need attention in terms of how do we respond. We also see that older adults are negatively impacted. As I mentioned, many of our seniors are alone, isolated, whether or not for their protection, but also because many of them aren't able to go out and it's not safe. And I think with the COVID-19 vaccine that is available, trying to address COVID hesitance, vaccine hesitancy and understanding how do we best get these resources to individuals and to talk to them in ways that are respectful and acceptable is really important. So acknowledging that, that is really important in terms of saving lives and taking care of elderly loved ones. When we think about, as I mentioned earlier, there's been a disproportionate grief impact because so many more Latino New Yorkers and Americans have died from COVID-19. And when we think about grief, we have to think about healing and what is the role of family, faith, as well as each other in terms of coming together and supporting how we can grieve and breathe in this time when we can't have the funerals, the acknowledgements and the family get gatherings um, that we often use to heal through these different times. 
And so there's this wonderful phrase, uh, quote by Juno Diaz, a uh, wonderful Dominican American author. It's never the changes we want that change everything. And during this time, it's definitely one of those times. But how do we use this time to come together to do the things that we need to, to take care of ourselves, but also each other, our loved ones in the community. And so I want to sort of, I've shared a lot of information and a lot of it has been very hard and very heavy because I think that those are our times. However, as hard as they are, I think that one of the things that's really important is really the strength and resilience within communities and within families. And within the Dominican community and within the Hispanic heritage, there's so much strength and resilience. So how can we tap into some of those things to take care of ourselves? And so through the Columbia University, there's this COPE Columbia initiative that really talks about the tree of resilience and where we get our resilience is through our values, through our self-care, through connecting with others, through hope, through gratitude and practicing mindfulness, but also being able to be flexible and forgiveness of ourselves and others. And I think that some of those keys to resilience are found in each and every one of you. And so part of that is tapping into some of those things. So acknowledging that mental illness is not shameful. It is something that can be treated and also acknowledgement and accepting of many of these different things in terms of our connections with others and each other, cultivating a sense of purpose, self-care and compassion, and faith in spirituality and the importance of culture and family as a part of our strengths. This is one acronym in terms of acceptance and commitment therapy and in terms of face COVID. And it's really an acronym looking at how do we protect ourselves, not only medically, but also psychologically and spiritually and emotionally against the pandemic, against COVID. And part of that is taking care of yourself inside and your emotional and psychological well-being. I also wanted to say that as a New Yorker, it's really important to also acknowledge the resources that are available. And if you need help and to also encourage others to get the help that they need and deserve through NYC Well, there's ways to chat in English and Spanish and getting help immediately so that you don't have to suffer and or your loved ones. And there's also ways that we can access our community resources in English and Spanish in the COVID-19 coping and emotional well-being through our NYC Gov website. So really acknowledging that these resources are available. Part of it is how do we bring them into our faith, our family, our new communities in a meaningful way. There's also New York Project Hope. So this is our emotional support line for individuals who are affected during COVID-19, whether or not from the grief and bereavement or some of the anxiety and stress that we mentioned earlier that is a part of COVID and all of the different impacts and ways to really get the help um, within New York City, New York State 24 seven. As I also mentioned, I've privileged to work with Dr. Lantigua at Columbia, and we have this resource around COPE Columbia that you can also look at different resources. And really, I love the quote of having someone help you doesn't mean you failed. It just means you're not alone. And during this time, the biggest thing that we can do to heal and strengthen each other is one another. And so it's being able to be connected, to reach out, to be a part of our families and our communities in meaningful ways. Social distancing does not mean emotional distancing. It's how can we come together in creative ways to be a part of each other's lives. So in conclusion, because I do want to leave a bit of time towards the end, is really just acknowledging that COVID-19, a pandemic, has had a large impact on all of our lives. All of our lives have changed. Think about a year ago and what we were doing and how that's changed from what we are doing now. However, how it changes us and what we do with it is up to us. We have the power to make better decisions that increase our community strength empowerment, but also to make our world a better place through diversity, inclusion and equity and health justice um, and other things that are incredibly important. Um, so acknowledging that 
COVID-19 has had a disproportionate impact in the Latino and the Hispanic community has been disproportionately impacted, not just because of COVID-19, but some of the underlying systemic and structural racism and inequity and health access issues that, you know, Dr. Michelin in his legacy has contributed to trying to address and how can we create a workforce um, that serves the community, that is the community, um, that is a part of the community to be a part of that solution, um, as well as mental health and psychological impact of all of this and acknowledging that we are all human um, and this has been a very difficult time, but how do we pull upon our resilience, our community resources, our faith-based organizations, our churches, our families, and really empowering and activating that community healing that is so important and also being aware of other government and our city resources that I shared through NYC Well as well as NYC Gov. You know I'd like to so, sort of end where uh, thinking of another Juno Diaz quote of the half-life of love is forever and I think that part of our healing is really tapping into the power of love and that's the love that we have for each other and the love of our humanity. And from another wonderful um, sort of uh, po poet as well as author, um, Love in the Time of Cholera, Gabriel Garcia Marquez, think of love as a state of grace, not as a means to anything, but an end in itself. And I think during this time, if we can come through this period of time as a way to really learn about and remind ourselves what's most important, um, and that's love, family, humanity, one another, then hopefully we'll be able to create a better future, regardless of what comes our way in the future. And so I just want to say mil gracias, um, and thank you so much for this really wonderful opportunity. And there's this wonderful that quote that says, tough times never last, but tough people do. And you have President Coco de Filipes, who is one of those peoples and aspiring leaders, as well as Dr. Lantigua, who is a hero for all of us in terms of acknowledging that they are the epitome of tough people and of the future and the hope um, that will be brighter than what it is, but we know what will be. Thank you. Thank you, Warren. What a lesson. What a beautiful, beautiful, beautiful relations. I mean, you can see and the audience can see why he was selected you not know, to give this inaugural lectures. I mean, at, uh, this is at uh, a Dominican. He's an honorary Dominican. I mean, somebody who has embraced. Yes, us. he is. Yes, yes, he is. Yes, yes. Can us. I say something, Dr. Lantigua, quickly? I love you, Madam President. Of course. Go ahead. I wanted to say, first of all, how absolutely moved to tears I was for your incredible empathy, for your incredible respect for culture, but your solidarity and for the words that you use, there is so much, you know, when you think about when you were showing those zip codes, the largest number was 10451. That is the zip code of Ostos. And, and, and so as I look at that, I certainly want to see that tree of resilience, get a copy of it and share it. And, I, I, and some of those resources, and in terms of what I can do here, I mean, part of what I'm trying to do is communicate a lot and have resources and CUNY has some, uh, some resources for both faculty and students uh, who are in crisis. Uh, but all the things that we could do that you could, if I could impose on both of you to think about, it would be great. It was, uh, you know, five o'clock is a tough hour uh, in terms of audience and we got over 50. At one point we have like 54. So I'm very happy that enough people got to hear your message. And, uh, and, and, and I just wanna thank you so very much, but anything that you can suggest that I can do would be great. I know that even with the uh, with the issue of vaccines, the faculty are preoccupied, some of them, and the students as well. The faculty, because they want to help the students trust the vaccine, and, and, and the students, because some of them come from a culture like mine, where you don't always trust medicine, because there's a history, at least in this country, of some communities being betrayed 
uh, by, by some of these so-called experiments and whatnot. So anything, any help, I am basically your disciple in this regard and happy to, to be guided in some of that. But certainly that tree of resilience, I would love to get that. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Lantigua, for your patience. No, no. The important thing is that we have been recorded. I mean, that it's available to students and faculty. If it, a professor wants to show this in one other class, I mean, it, obviously it's going to be at the library and available to them. We have some questions. Uh, it's a parent who is asking, is there anything that we could do to identify any of our children in terms of the fear and COVID-19? What could we be looking? I mean, when we face them, what kind of discussion do we have with our teenagers about the COVID-19? I think that the most important thing, and I just wanted to thank you, um, President Coco de Filipas, and just really, I think our partnership is what F this is all about, and how can we best come together to support the ones that we care about in our communities. Um, so I'm just privileged to have this honor. And Dr. Lantigua, it's it's really an honor and you're my hero. And I've had the privilege of serving at the community within Washington Heights for the last 23 years. And I've learned so much and I'm so humbled by the, the power and the strength within the community, um, particularly the Dominican and the Latino community here, which has taught me so much of what I was able to share today. But in terms of with children and teenagers, the most important thing is to listen. You know, one of the things that a lot of teenagers or young people, um, sometimes as when we're worried about them, sometimes we'll talk too much. I think what's really important is really to listen, to find out where they're at, because sometimes it's really understanding how can we best, best help them, because they may be worried about things that we're not worried about, but also have questions that we are not thinking about. So I think that one way that we talk to kids and young people and teenagers is first, let them know that I care about you, I love you, I'm worried about you, I'd like to listen to hear about what's going on and trying to get into a dialogue. The important thing is communication because a lot of things will affect young people in different ways. Part of it is being able to see it through their eyes and they will see the world in a very different way because what they're having the most hard time with is not having a sense of their peers, their friends, their community. Young people live in the world of each other. And this is the time that they've been robbed of that experience. And we need to understand how can we best help you in making it through because this is very difficult and this is a part of your development. So understanding have there been any changes in your young person's sleep, their appetite, their energy, the things that they enjoy. Um, I have one young person that, that I take care of. When he stopped playing his video games, I knew something was wrong because uh, he is someone who lives for his games. But then that's when I knew, okay, this is when something is worse than what it was before. And let's take a look at this. And he was a teenager that I'm working with in the community and really understanding what makes that person tick, but also what brings them joy. So let's talk about one of bringing in more of the things that are connected. It. So sometimes we're always on our devices. How can we take this pandemic time to sit down and have a family dinner? How can we sit down to really come together as a family, um, through our love, through our faith, through our community, to do the things which we might really do differently. Because I think that these are opportunities to live our values and also strengthen our commitments. Um, so I think that when I think about kids, um, I think about the grown-ups. And I think that when you're better, they're better. So one of the things that I often say to parents is that be your best self and they will benefit from you and they will learn from you. So some of the things as parents, the more that we're able to take care of ourselves, address our needs, the more that we can give to others and our children and our families. So I just want to acknowledge that many parents are doing triple duty, doing way too much at a time when it demands it. But I also want to say it's important to also give yourself permission to be tired, permission to get rest, permission to get sleep. Um, and permission to get help, because um, all those things are really an important part of being able to um, respond during this time and find that strength and resilience. Excellent answer. Thank you very much, Warren, again. I mean, like I said, we are so proud of the work that you do, Washington Heights, extended to the Bronx. I mean, at, uh, as I mentioned in the beginning, this is the first one for a lecture series. But again, I mean, at, uh, 
to have you at, at the inaugural was outstanding an excellent decision of the foundation and we really appreciate it. I mean, well in depth, I mean, I am in depth with you, as you know, I mean, I am, I mean, in, in that sense. At, uh, but uh, we have more to come, I mean, next month, we have another one, I mean, at, again, at, and we know that also can count on you. We know that knowing the kind of person that you are, we know that Dr. Coco Philippe is at the Madam President can call you anytime and you will be there for us. Thank you again, thank you. I want to allow Dr. Coco Philippe to say the last word this evening at uh, having a wonderful afternoon that I started at two o'clock in the afternoon and now we are finishing four hour later. Madam President. There is, let me just say my heart is bursting with gratitude and love for this afternoon and for the promise of this first inaugural presentation. You have given me so much hope, Dr. Ang. I think some of the language, sometimes I feel a little foolish because I do talk about love and hope a lot because he has helped me. I do talk, in fact, I had uh, an interview uh, last, yesterday or the day before with a group of faculty about, and I said, you begin uh, the day, I begin a little early doing the thing, things that make me feel that I'm center and move on. And so you've given so much that is practical, but the love of those quotes, books absolutely that I love, you know, Diaz and uh, Garcia Marquez and, 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 and what really got to me was la, el corazón de la llama solo el cuchillo la conoce. It brought me back home to, uh, to listen to my grandmother when I was a young girl. So the gift of this, of this afternoon, Dr. Lantigua, you, I cannot even begin to express what the promise that today is about future collaborations, how much we need you, how much we appreciate you. Please know that. And this is just, and Dr. Ang, there gotta be a time when things get a little better, when I can make you a little Dominican flan and you come and have a cafecito with me. Okay, because I think there's a, there's a Dominican in that Aoyama, in that Corazon de Aoyama. There is a, there's a Dominican there too. So thank you. Thank you for the respect, for the love, for the knowledge, for the wealth of knowledge and for the peace that you have given us in terms of understanding what are some of the practical things we can do to help one another. So thank you so much, Dr. Lantigua. Thank you, my colleagues, for participating, for all of the support. Thank you to everyone. This is a day, I am so happy that it fell when they scheduled this, they didn't know it was my birthday. But, and I said, I'm doing it. But I couldn't have celebrated my birthday in a more beautiful way. I am, I am, I'm just, my cup runneth over. Mil gracias y bendiciones. Gracias.